When you think of conquering Mount Everest, the only thing that crosses your mind is climbing up and down the mountain and making it out alive and hopefully in one peak. Sometimes people increase the challenge by climbing without oxygen or taking more difficult routes. But for Marco Sofredi, just climbing up and down Mount Everest wasn't enough. He was an extreme sportsman and dreamed of descending Mount Everest on a snowboard. He had successfully gone down major Himalayan mountains by snowboard before, and he surprisingly wasn't the only one to attempt going down Mount Everest this way either. But on September 8, 2002, Marco was standing on the summit of Mount Everest, looking out at what would be his famed descent, with his Sherpa standing beside him. What they didn't know at the time was that this trip would go very differently from every other one before. I'm Tatiana, and this is a current. Marco Sofredi was born in Chimney, France on May 22, 1979, and he came from a climbing family. In fact, he came from a climbing town. Chimney, France was surrounded by mountains, specifically Mont Blanc. People of all ages would die trying to climb these mountains. Most were in their 20s and 30s, but some were as young as teenagers, and the collective ambition to conquer the mountains caused climbers to perish at such a quick rate that the cemetery of Chimney was in disarray. There was almost an air of living with purpose above all else, no matter how short your life is. Death was an accepted but unspoken thing there. It's just something that happens when you spend so much time in the mountains, when you prioritize climbing over everything. In 1994, Marco's father, Philippe, bought Marco his first snowboard. As snowboarding was growing in popularity, and a close friend introduced Marco to backcountry snowboarding where people go down mountains on their own snowboard and off the official tracks. And this immediately became a passion of Marco's, which was ironic considering growing up, his parents could not get him to do outdoor activities with them. As a child, his father said they had to force him to go on walks with them, and he would cry and whine the entire time. They didn't even bother trying to teach him to climb because of this, so Marco actually taught himself how to do those things. But now, Marco was starting to find his identity, his punk rock daredevil identity. He had neon hair and a gap in his teeth. June 17, 1996, Marco planned to be the second person to descend the north face of Aiguille du Midi, a very dangerous slope in the Mont Blanc region, and he would be the first to do it on a snowboard. The only other person to do it before him was Jean-Marc Boivon, and he wasn't on a snowboard, but he was Marco's hero. His mother, Michelle, couldn't stop him no matter how hard she tried and had to sit and wait and hope he succeeded because at this point, Marco had only been snowboarding for a year. Michelle, who was from a wealthy family, was a secretary and a part-time sea coach. Marco's father, Philippe, actually had a passion for climbing mountains too. He was a part-time mountain guide because his own father persuaded him to pursue a different lifestyle, one that was safer, so he became a hairstylist. But that made Philippe vow that he would never shield his children from the mountains or stop them from pursuing their own callings. But I wonder if he would have changed his mind if he had known what the future held. But now Marco climbed the mountain with Louis and Massage, and it was their first time climbing together. While they're climbing, Marco can just feel his dream within arm's reach. Going down his native mountain was something he felt compelled to do. He had been studying every nook and cranny of Aguay du Midi through binoculars for so long, he couldn't put off his dream anymore. Seven hours after beginning the climb, Marco and Louis reached the summit, and Marco was ready to make history. He strapped on a snowboard with what felt like the entire town watching with binoculars, and descended the mountain. He made it to the bottom without taking off his snowboard, and at 17, he made history. He had his supporters in town, but he also had a lot of people calling him crazy and telling him he would be dead soon because Marco didn't care about the mountain guides or their rules. He started to plan even more dangerous and challenging descents because Marco had set his sights on Mount Everest. He now wanted to be the first person to go down the tallest mountain in the world on a snowboard. But first, she conquered Huayna Potosi, a 6,000er mountain in Bolivia which was just short of 20,000 feet tall. 
After that, he made his Everest goal known, and Philippe pointed him in the direction of the safest mountaineer he knew of, Russell Bryce. Russell was the owner of Himalayan Experience, a climbing expedition company. He had never had a single death in any of his expedition groups before. So Marco reached out to Russell, and Russell doesn't really take him seriously. He's used to people being interested in climbing with him until they hear the cost of his expeditions. But Russell agreed to meet at a pub back in Chimney, and when he laid eyes on Marco, he couldn't take it seriously at all. Marco, a teenager, all punk rock looking with his neon colored hair and a gap in his teeth, approached Russell with a lawyer. And Russell's confused because he doesn't know why Marco would bring a lawyer. A lawyer wouldn't force him to take Marco to Everest. Marco needed to convince him to do that. As they sat there talking, the idea started to grow on Russell. He realized that Marco's outward appearance was very different from his calm personality. So Russell lets him know, snowboarding down Everest is possible, but he needed to conquer other 8,000ers first. Marco doesn't hesitate and agrees immediately. So he goes to his parents and makes a deal. His parents would pay him in advance and he would work at the campsite that his family owned in town to work it off over a few years time. Now Marco wasn't an only child. He had a brother and a sister, and Marco and his sister worked at the campsite together. His brother, Pierre, loved the mountains too, but when Marco was just 18 months old, Pierre was killed in an avalanche on the mountains. His parents didn't talk about it when Marco was young, but when he was six, he saw an avalanche on TV and pointed to it and said, Pierre. The loss of his brother clearly didn't slow down his ambitions or stop his parents from funding his adventures and future loss wouldn't stop him either. He conquered all the mountains around Chimney and planned to travel to conquer more challenging mountains further away. But before he left, one of his friend's mothers gave him a small cross as a talisman for protection, and Martha would wear it for all but one trip. Two friends went with Marco when he left to conquer the mountains of the world, Philip Fort and Rene Roberts. Rene was actually a photographer and recorded most of Marco's attempts. Now, Russell told Marco, when they met, to take the slow. But that's not what Marco would do. First, they went to the 6,000er, Taklarajo, in Peru. Then they went to Nepal, where he successfully descended a 30,000-foot mountain named Dorj Lakka. And then, in 1999, Philip Fort was killed in an avalanche, just like Marco's brother. That wouldn't stop Marco, though. In 2000, he went on to conquer Cho Oyu an 8,000er mountain that was almost 27,000 feet above sea level. And that was the final mountain before Marco felt ready to conquer Everest. In spring of 2001, a few weeks before the planned Everest descent, everyone in the climbing group paid Russell $36,000. The 36000 that Marco paid was from his time working as a manager at his family's campsite. During the few weeks before climbing season began, Marco became close with the locals. Most of them didn't speak English, but that didn't matter to Marco. He would hang out with the Sherpas that would help the group during their ascent. He rode in their wagon, and they were amused by him. They even gave him the name Chicken Parent, because he bought a $2 jacket that Russell told him not to get because it was worthless, but Marco believed that there were goose feathers in the jacket, even though Russell told him they were chicken feathers. But that didn't matter, and he still bought the jacket it would start falling apart and the feathers would get stuck on everyone in the group. So Marco walking around with a featherless sleeveless jacket got him that interesting nickname. The locals really enjoyed Marco though. He was described as being truly authentic. To help pass the time, Marco would listen to rap music he didn't understand, read his favorite book, The Little Prince, and rack up huge bills talking to his girlfriend, Stephanie, using a satellite phone. And now it was May, the time to ascend Everest was here, and Marco heard that a doctor named Stefan God from Austria was also trying to accomplish the exact same thing he was, descending Mount Everest on a snowboard. There was a bit of a race going on. Marco wanted to be first, but Stefan started climbing before they did. Stefan wasn't using Sherpas or oxygen for his attempt, and Marco honestly considered giving up. But before they started the climb, the Sherpas did a ritual puja offering to the gods. Marco was an atheist and had nothing to offer, but he treated their beliefs with respect and offered his own snowboard. 
And maybe that gave him the luck he needed, because during his ascent, he heard news that Dr. Stefan had made it to the bottom of Everest on a snowboard. But just when he was about to lose hope, Marco then heard that Stefan had unstrapped his snowboard and was disqualified for that reason. With his renewed spirits, he continued to climb, but they had to make a change of plans. With the spring weather, there wasn't a lot of snow on the mountain. Marco's original plan was to come down the Hornbein Couloir, but the lack of snow made that route impossible. Luckily, he did have a plan B. The Great Couloir appeared to have enough snow, so that was the route he would take. On May 23rd, the day after he turned 22, Marco stood on top of Mount Everest. The cold caused the bindings on his snowboard to crack, but one of the Sherpas was able to fix it with some rusty wire. He was wearing the talisman from his friend's mom, and he started his descent. He snowboarded down the mountain, going around climbers still going up. At one point, he stopped for an hour to catch his breath before he continued on. He made it back to base camp in four hours, and without unstrapping his snowboard. Marco's success spread internationally. A 22-year-old was the first person to snowboard down Mount Everest. Some people felt he shouldn't have been awarded the title because he used oxygen, but he was given it anyway. But that wasn't enough for Marco. He was warned to stop while he was ahead and not take more unnecessary chances. But Marco needed to take the chance one more time. The route he took was not the most challenging or dangerous. It was plan B. Marco wanted to succeed at plan A, the route he was originally supposed to take, the Hornbein Couloir. So he started to prepare again and went to Mount Shishapangma in the fall of 2001 to practice, but the winds were too strong and Marco had to climb back down instead. Still, the following summer, Marco, Russell, and two Sherpas went back to Shimini to plan the Everest descent. Various obstacles slowed them down, and Marco needed $50,000 to finance the second Everest attempt. Marco didn't have sponsors. He didn't want them, and he barely did any competitions anyway. He didn't want photographers to document his activities. Pretty much the only person he allowed to take photos was Rene, or the Sherpas. Snowboarding was about purity and being free. He didn't believe in fame and thought it was distracting. But like clockwork, his father showed out the money and Russell promised to send the best Sherpas with Marco. Before leaving Shimini, Marco hinted at settling down with Stephanie and getting married when he returned. But on August 8, 2002, Marco unknowingly left his hometown of Shimini for the last turn. Marco met with three Sherpas and a guide named Oliver Besson in Kathmandu. Russell wouldn't be with the group this time. He was in the Himalayas helping with another group since Marco was his only client wanting to do Everest at the time. He would study the north face of Everest with binoculars and could see a lot of small avalanches. He needed to wait for the snow to settle. This wasn't the traditional time to climb due to the dangerous weather. The mountain was practically empty of climbers, but to Marco, it was perfect. The increase of snow meant snowboarding down his dream route would be possible. But with all of the avalanches and the strong winds, that part of Everest was starting to become bare. Marco was in charge of his climbing group, so he controlled how fast everyone ascended and pushed everyone to climb faster. He started to show potential signs of altitude sickness. He had a constant headache and felt tired and lonely. He racked up huge phone bills calling a meteorologist named Jan Githendaner and his girlfriend back home. The changing weather and snowstorms caused more delays. The group explored the north side on August 28th and Marco snowboarded on the way back. That night, there was another snowstorm, and they spent the next few days trying to make new plans. They were constantly calling Jan back home for updates about the weather, but the weather changed every day. And then, on September 4th, Jan said the 8th would be ideal weather, so Marco began climbing on the 6th. He called his parents and told them he was still at the lower camp to not worry them. But by the 7th, the group had entered the dense zone. When the weatherman called Marco and warned him to descend quickly, because that evening the weather would turn bad, and he wasn't sure what the weather would look like on Sunday, the day Marco wanted to attempt his second descent of Everest. Ending that phone call, Jan Gissendaner would later say, the way Marco ended the call was off, and it scared him a little. Normally, ending a conversation with someone you plan to see again, they would say, au revoir, but Marco said adieu, which is something you say when you aren't planning to see someone again. 
Marco quickly called another friend after that and said the snow felt great and he felt strong, but the phone ended up dying. And then they started the final push to the summit. They struggled to make it to the top. They were up to their chest in snow, and the Sherpas were working hard to help Marco. At 2 p.m., they reached the peak, and it took three times longer to get there than the first time they went. When they were up there, Marco voiced how tired he was from all the climbing from too much snow. But the Sherpas could see the clouds moving, indicating a storm was coming and knew they needed to get back down soon. They tried to tell Marco to abandon the plan. It was late, after 3 p.m., but Marco had set his sights on coming down Everest that day. Before going up, people said they saw a change in his eyes. He looked determined, like this was it. It was now or never, and nothing was going to stop him from reaching his goal. They couldn't persuade him otherwise. So Marco changed his oxygen, and in his backpack he had more oxygen, water, and a rope. And without his talisman, since he left it back in Chimney, Marco looked at the Sherpas, and one of them told him to take care. And Marco said, okay, see you tomorrow. And then he went down the mountain. The Sherpas quickly started making their way back down, not wanting to be caught in the storm, but could see Marco in the distance. At the same time, news spread around Chimney that Marco reached the top of Everest. And that's how his parents found out that he had actually started climbing. But while everyone was cheering for him, his parents could only worry. Because the only thing they could think of was the time difference between Nepal and France meant that at the time of them hearing about Marco's ascent, it should have actually been news about his descent. He should have been down by now. But they heard nothing. The only thing his mother could think of was not again. They already lost one child to the mountains. A second one would be impossible to handle. While Marco descended the mountain, Oliver watched through binoculars as long as he could from base camp before losing sight of Marco and hoping he made it to a camp that the Yak Shepherd was preparing for him. But now the Sherpas were arriving at Camp 3 and saw the outline of a person. At first, they were upset because the person didn't turn on a light for them. They thought it was Oliver, who was supposed to be keeping track of Marco at base camp. But then they realized it had to be someone else. Except they couldn't figure out who because no one was supposed to be on the slope that day except for their group. Once they got to the camp, they realized no one was there. There weren't footprints or traces of anyone being at camp. And Marco should have been much lower by now or even at base camp. By the time the Sherpas made it to base camp, still no one had heard from Marco. All anyone could think about was how he didn't come down on September 8th like he was supposed to. He didn't come down the day after or even the day after that. And by that point, everyone considered him dead because to survive that long on Everest was impossible. Murtho was never seen again, and the Sherpas felt that the silhouette they saw in the distance on the mountain was Marco's in their own way. They felt it was his spirit because he didn't come down the mountain, and no one knows where he's at today. Where his tracks ended, there was nowhere for him to fall into a crevasse or disappear off the side of the mountain. It was a suitable area for snowboarding, nothing too difficult for a talented athlete like Marco. His friends and family went to the mountain to search. His tracks were still visible, and nobody could figure out what happened to him. To this day, there have been no traces of anything belonging to Marco that had ever been found. His father believes he sat down to rest and was so exhausted he fell asleep and died. Others believe he fell, either off the mountain or into a crevasse, even though there were none along his route. Some say a small avalanche could have taken him, and the Sherpas just didn't see it because sometimes that can happen. His sister, who was pregnant at the time of this tragedy, believes he got down safely, and since he accomplished his dream, decided to quietly go live life in the local village near the mountain. Leave what you think happened in the reviews or comments, and don't forget to follow or subscribe. All sources can be found at occurrencepond.com. Stay safe, and see you next week.